The Carnegie Mellon Quarantine Database Talks are made possible by the Stephen Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real and by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Uh, guys, welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, today we have uh, a guest speaker, uh, Jackie Yan from Snowflake. Um, again, Snowflake went IPO last week, so we're glad that he could find time from his uh, high-flying lifestyle to, to spend with us to talk about, talk about databases. Um, so Jackie's been with Snowflake since 2015. Prior to that, he was a, a senior member of the technical staff at Oracle, and he did his undergrad and master's, undergrad and master's degree uh, at, at Duke University in computer science and uh, mathematics. So again, we're super, awesome, super happy for him to be here today. We also want to thank the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real, for sponsoring us. And we'll do like we do every week. Uh, if you have any questions, please unmute your mic, state who you are, where you're coming from, and ask Jackie a question. And please interrupt at any time. We want this to be interactive. Okay. Jackie, go, for it. go for it. All right. I'll get started. Uh, before I get started, I would, I would say a disclaimer. Some of the slides uh, were from a pr previous presentation I did before where I had talking points. Some other slides I recently made, and uh, I don't have talking points, so I might be very smooth in some of the slides and not as smooth in others. So just bear with me. Uh, so I'll start with the agenda. So I'll give a brief overview of Snowflake's architecture. Then uh, I'll talk about Snowflake's query optimizer, give an overview there, and uh, we'll take a deeper look into some of the particular uh, query optimizations that uh, I, I find interesting. And finally, I'll touch upon uh, this philosophy of, of data-driven development uh, that we follow at Snowflake. So I'll start with a Snowflake overview. And so, so this is kind of a picture that shows uh, traditional uh, OLAP databases. And they fall into uh, the camps of either shared disk architecture or a kind of shared nothing architecture. Uh, both of these architectures have lots of merits, uh, but they also kind of suffer from a number of bottlenecks, such as uh, contention for resources, not enough processing power, not enough elasticity and scalability, and so on. And Snowflake provides a solution for these problems in the, uh, in the cloud environment by breaking into three distinct layers of storage, compute, and cloud services, uh, where each individual layer scales independently. Our architecture takes advantage of the cloud native uh, characteristics like scalability and elasticity and avoids the resource congestion problems uh, most often seen in on-premises uh, traditional databases. Uh, we call this the multi-cluster shared data architecture. And this architecture is also cloud agnostic and enables Snowflake to run on all the three major uh, cloud providers. Uh, so at, at the core, the storage layer here that you see is a single place to centralize all the data. And Snowflake provides a large suite of tools for uh, seamless ingestion and transforming of the data. Uh, it provides native support for both structured and unstructured data and leverages the elasticity and scale and, and the cost of the blob storage. Snowflake separates the storage from the compute so, uh, so customers can run multiple workloads across multiple teams on the same set of data without resource contention. And more importantly, the multi-cluster compute layer allows workloads to scale up and scale out as needed. So workloads also leverage precisely the compute as needed. Uh, and uh, at, the, at the very out outmost, you see the Snowflake's uh, services layer, which is really the brain of the architecture. So at the workload, as, a, as a workload hits Snowflake, this layer determines the, uh, the unique requirement for getting the processing done in the most performant and cost-effective manner. The services layer takes care of all the query optimization, security, transaction processing, and metadata management uh, automatically with near zero administration required. And finally, since the customer data is potentially everywhere, Snowflake is as well. So the cloud agnostic layer means that the, the customer can distribute their data across cloud regions or even across providers while maintaining the same Snowflake experience without having to deal with additional complexities such as uh, managing connections and replications and so on. That's, that's, that's awesome marketing speak, but can you say roughly what percentage of the customers are AWS versus GCP versus Azure, out of curiosity? So I'd say uh, over 95% of the customers on either Azure or AWS, GCP is a pretty small percentage, uh, both because Google BigQuery is a very good, a very good technical uh, product and because you know, Google Cloud is, is uh, relatively kind of a newcomer in, in the cloud market. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, at the moment, AWS is, is still dominating the kind of the share. I, I'd say, I would say maybe 60, 70 percent. I, I don't have exact numbers, but that's sure. kind of roughly my, my thinking. But but we see Azure growing very very fast, uh, especially outside the U.S. in Europe. And in Europe, the mind share is is I would say pretty much 50 50 between Azure and AWS uh, 
and in some cases, Azure is actually uh, has a lot, lot larger market share than AWS in Europe. So that's definitely uh, kind of what we we're seeing uh, in Azure. Yeah, but you know, in the US, AWS is pretty much dominant. Uh, although you know, for companies that are competitors to uh, to Amazon, they they usually prefer Microsoft. Uh, they're very very large companies that uh, that prefer uh, prefer Microsoft because of that. And okay, so scale, yeah. So currently, Snowflake has developments in over 20 regions across four continents and all three cloud providers. And we have hundreds of petabytes of data under management. Uh, this might be a little bit uh, outdated, so, so maybe we have more these days. Uh, with single tables with uh, compressed size of over, uh, over uh, in, the petab in the petabyte range and trillions of rows in a single table. We manage a fleet of uh, tens of thousands of servers in, uh, in each deployment. And, where the infrastructure is very highly automatic, elastic, and, and self-healing. Uh, so now before I go into the uh, uh, details of the optimizer, I want to mention a kind of a key architectural component of Snowflake, which is uh, micropartitions. And micropartitions are essentially uh, partitions with our, which are relatively small in size, and they correspond to immutable files for, for data storage uh, on, the, on the blob stores in the, in the, in the cloud providers. And uh, each, immutable, each immutable file is essentially follows a text format, which is a hybrid columnar format. And from the kind of bottom right, you can see there's a header and you know, uh, the pointers to kind of uh, regions of, region of compressed column data. And the, the columns are, the values of each column are group, grouped together and they are compressed uh, according to different compression schemes, depending on the, the property of the data and so on. And each micropartition is a unit of DMLs. It's a unit of transactions and change tracking mechanism inside of Snowflake. And this is very important uh, for, for many, many reasons. And this really simplifies the, the transaction management a lot in Snowflake. It also makes it much easier to collect uh, optimizer stats, for example, um, as part of the DML. And uh, you know, for very large tables, it could contain many, 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 many millions of micropartitions in Snowflake. And this kind of flexibility really makes it, uh, makes it uh, very, very easy to apply kind of fine-grained pruning on, on uh, the data in a table and uh, really kind of make, you know, makes many of the optimization uh, kind of work very well. And there are, we provide a way to kind of rearrange the underlying uh, layout of micropartitions for our table. And this is what we uh, dubbed the automatic clustering service uh, that can be uh, where people can specify kind of clustering keys for our table to rearrange the micropartitions to improve uh, various kind of uh, optimizations such as pruning. So now let's go into query optimization. Uh, Jack, we have a question. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, I was I was gonna ask a question. I, I was wondering. I from my understanding, you create uh, columns from unstructured data. Uh, is there a limit on how many columns you'll create, and and what happens to the extra columns if you have, say, you know, a ten thousand column record uh, in JSON? Do you stop creating new columns at some point, or how how does that how does that yes. work? Yes. Yes. There's a limit to uh, to the number of columns that we can. Essentially. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, there's a limit to the, a spam. Keep going. There's a limit to the number of columns we can what we call columnize, and this is a kind of opportunistic optimization where uh, you know our query engine deals very well with the cases where uh, a portion of the partitions of the micro partitions have a particular path or a particular kind of uh, kind of path uh, columnize, whereas uh, maybe other you know, a significant number, a significant percentage of other micropartitions may not have this column, uh, column rise. So, uh, so, so we kind of deal with that uh, kind of transparently. And for the columns where we have uh, columnization, there are obviously there are two main advantages. One is we do have metadata for these for these columns that we that we materialize or that we columnize, and we can apply optimizations on regular columns the same way we apply it to these these uh, kind of uh, what we call sub columns, really. And, and for example, pruning, so people might write a, a particular predicate on a particular subpath in JSON, and uh, we would actually use to prune and apply all the regular query optimization techniques on that column. We treat it effectively as a, as a regular column. And uh, for uh, execution, it's the same thing. Uh, you know, it's essentially a, a you know implicitly it's, a, it's the same as a regular column. And for the columns that are not uh, columnized then we essentially regard that as kind of uh, unknown metadata, a column with unknown metadata. So, so in many cases, we will not be able to apply uh, optimizations on these columns, but they don't, in fact, impact uh, any, any, anything in regard to correctness, for example. So all of that will still work. Um, but the, you know, the columns that are not columnized, 
would be would be less performant in that in that sense. And we could we're we're looking into ways to make these uh, more uh, intelligent. Uh, whereas instead of making local decisions, we could we could look at workload information. We could look at a bunch of other information to kind of improve uh, the efficiency of of this this process. Um, yeah. Thank you. Hey, Jackie, I have a question. Suptik here. A uh, small question. So, is this immutable data storage, uh, like this design, is it because of you, uh, the storage layer being uh, object stores? Is this yes. why you guys did? So, uh, do you also work on immut uh, on mutable storage uh, layer, like for uh, for AWS or something, or is it just object stores and storage layer? Uh, for for the most basic version of the Snowflake table, it's all on that uh, immutable store, and and yes. Uh, the original design is based on that, based on the limitation. But then we actually figure out, we actually found many, many good properties of this. Uh, for example, with the immutable storage comes the uh, the usage of of micro partitions as a unit of the MLs and transactions. Right? If it's immutable, then then we would not be uh, the many many optimizations would not be only a metadata optimization. We would actually have to look at the data. So so this is actually uh, a blessing to us uh, in many sense. Uh, even though the original kind of uh, point that we started looking into this was was because of the limitation from the blob storage. Makes sense. Thanks. Okay, so let me go into an overview of query optimization. Uh, this is a little bit of a very simple uh, picture, and pretty much I think everybody kind of knows about the life of a query. Uh, I'll just briefly go over here. Uh, it, it's by no means the comprehensive picture. So uh, at the top, you see the kind of the cloud services layer. Which receives the query, and these are sent over through uh, clients, and they can be ODBC, JDBC, Web UI, Python, uh, any number of uh, kind of clients. And we have um, we have I think over over ten or fifteen clients that we support these days, and we have uh, hundreds of hundreds of partners uh, connectors that we support. And once the queries are sent through to Snowflake, we do a very lightweight compilation essentially that does the result cache lookup. We check to see if, if the result of this particular query is is already there, and if, if it's there, then we uh, we kind of directly return the result. Uh, and we, if we see that it, you know it didn't hit the result cache, then we actually go to actually compile the query. This is step three, where we go through the planner and optimizer to process the query. Uh, here we list a, a few. Of how the, how aggressive is your result cache? Like like how like I mean, does it have to be an exact match? Are you are you are you playing games with like uh, semantics so, of the query? Yeah, that's a good question. So we we are not as intelligent as we'd like, but we do certain optimizations. Like uh, if like um, if the version of the table has changed, let's say if there's a there's a change in the underlying table, uh, we could still check the when the underlying what we call scan set, uh, which is the the result of micro partitions to scan after pruning. And if that's the same, then we will still be able to use the result cache. Uh, so we do we do a kind of we do certain uh, optimizations before we decide whether a result is, re is reusable. So there are a bunch of things like that. There are also things like reusing uh, kind of, uh, if, a, if a result of a query is kind of a subquery that can be reused, then we can also kind of reuse that. But there are also things that we, that we don't do. So there are, all, there, are, there are optimizations that we do, but there are things that we would like to do better sure. as well. Okay, um, cool. It's, uh, I forgot the exact data, but we have we have pretty ex extensive monitoring of, of such usage, and, and it's it's a pretty widely used feature. Actually, it's a, a bit surprising that you know, uh, especially in the OLAP world, many people, many tools that just re kind of issue these queries over and over again, and, and they would actually do hit the result cache. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a quick question on the result cache thing too. Um, Paul, I'm Paul Dix, I'm from Flux. I'm curious, I, I assume because it's like all analytic data, you have like this constant flow of like new data coming in. Yeah. So how do you deal with like a new new flow of data coming in all the time and with trying to cache results? Right, so the result, so the, um, so there's no uh, proactive data, proactive process that's happening, right? So the results are, are cached only when a previous uh, query actually generated that result. So there's no previous query, then we we don't do anything. So it's kind of a lazy process there. Um, and and if the data new, that the new data data that comes in can be somehow pruned out, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, of the of the set of partitions that we figure out to scan, then we would be able to match that with a previous. Uh, essentially, we compute some sort of signature right on that on that uh, on a set of inputs that includes the list of partitions to scan for that query uh, and a set of other kind of other things. And as long as that signature matches, we will be able to kind of look up. 
Uh, so it's a pretty simple mechanism. So we don't do anything proactive in terms of like uh, proactively compute the result for for a query or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi, this is Stephen. May I ask a question? Yeah. Um, for a lot of the BI tools that sit on an OLAP solution like Snowflake, let's say if there are some entries being just added, is Snowflake able to use the partial result earlier and it just simply add the delta from the addition of that pen to a table? Right. Um, so we don't do that today. Um, and uh, and it's it's one direction that we're we're looking at, but 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 yeah, we don't we don't do that today. Yeah. Uh, and result cache is kind of a yeah, it's kind of something related to related to that, but but we don't. Uh, um, so so yeah, there are other ways that we do like materialized views, which is kind of similar to what you're describing, which uh, actually uh, people can use to to return these these kind of results um, by by. Materializing something, uh, and and then you know the materialized views actually actually has has an automatic refresh mechanism that uh, that produces uh, the the data in the materialized views. Um, so so in that sense, it's it's similar to what you're describing. Um, but in a general sense, uh, you know our, our materialized views is not does not cover uh, any general general query. It, it, it only conforms to a, a fixed shape of query, which actually can be incrementally refreshed. And if it's something that we don't know how to uh, very Efficiently incrementally refresh, then we don't do it uh, currently. Thank you. Okay, cool. So yeah, I'll t yeah, and then yeah, the third step is to kind of the planner and optimizer, and after the after we generate the plan, we go to uh, the virtual warehouse to process the query, and here is a little bit more a little bit more detail there. So it, it only scans the needed data from local SSD cache or blob storage, and it processes the data and returns to results to the cloud services layer. And finally, in the result set, there's a return uh, process that uh, uses pagination for large results, for example, uh, and it also caches the caches the result uh, in the block storage again, uh, back into the essentially the, the block storage to be uh, to be returned uh, to the client. So that's the overall query processing process. And now let's, let's talk a little bit about optimizer. And uh, first, I'll talk about the optimizer's philosophy. So our query optimizer is cost based. With many many non-cost based optimizations, and uh, the the main reason is is we want we want kind of a robust optimizer, and uh, and we want to kind of favor plan stability compared to uh, a super clever or a super optimized query plan. I would say that's kind of the main reason why we decided to do it this way. Um, and our focus is on optimizations for analytical queries. These are include the the you know the common constructs uh, as well as other you know. And analytics constructs like window functions, uh, recursive CTEs, pivot and pivots, uh, and things like that, which are pretty common uh, requests among analytical queries. And uh, our cost model has a, an emphasis on common analytics data models, such as star joins. But then uh, our cost model is also generally, general enough to support any data model. Uh, so it, it makes certain assumptions about the online data models uh, in, in our optimizer's cost model, but that's not overriding. Uh, it, there's no strict requirement uh, there, and yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, we focus really on on the optimizer's robustness and plan stability, as opposed to generating the the best, really the, the most optimized plan. And uh, we leave uh, the other the other assumption is we leave as much to the execution as possible, where we assume the optimizer can make mistakes, uh, both due to its own limitations as well as limitations in the uh, in the input uh, regarding Carnati estimation, for example. And we want the execution to be able to correct mistakes from uh, from optimization time, and uh, the way to do it is we try to adapt as much as possible in execution time. And the final point uh, is we want to leave as little to the user as possible. Uh, so, for example, for for many traditional databases, there are uh, there's thousands, if not tens of thousands, of parameters that the DBA or the user can tune. Whereas uh, for for Snowflake, even today, I believe uh, across the whole system, we expose Something like 20 parameters uh, to the users, and and most of these parameters are not uh, used for tuning uh, tuning the the query engine itself. They're more like tuning certain uh, behaviors in transactions and, and things like that. Um, and and uh, and this is kind of really really our philosophy, which is to uh, to produce a good enough plan to produce a good plan that's that's runs very good out of the box, and there's there's very little tuning that the user needs to perform. Uh, so these are all the philosophies that, that we try to practice uh, in our implementation. Uh, 
here's a little bit more details into our, our stats collection process. And uh, it's really not, not very complicated. Uh, I think uh, the basic idea is we automatically collect stats or metadata at, at multiple levels uh, as part of the, uh, the DML or the transaction process. Uh, so for example, there are stats we collect at the table and the micro partition level. These include the things like the number of rows in the table, uh, the size in the bytes, uh, with uh, compression information, for example, uh, you know, uh, depending on the how, how you know the the memory footprint of, of the data can vary dramatic, uh, drastically uh, with compressed and uncompressed, uncompressed data. So depending on the use case, uh, we can make use of these, these kind of information. Uh, we also have column level stats. Uh, these are very common kind of zone map uh, stats like min max, uh, null counts, and distinct counts. We also have, like I mentioned earlier, uh, sub column level stats, which are very similar, essentially the same as column stats. These are for the uh, the column pass the common pass in semi structured data, which we decided to columnize as part of the uh, the creation process for the micro partitions. And because the micro partitions are created as part of each DML and then uh, they're created uh, in a transactional way, the stats are always up to date and they're always accurate for each micro partition. Uh, so these stats are used as input to the optimizer's cost model. They're also used as input to certain other uh, compile time optimizations that we do, like pruning and custom folding. And uh, finally, the, the column and data metadata are actually cached in the, in the cloud services layer because we want to have very, very low latency access to these, to these metadata and to these stats uh, as part of the compilation process. Um, hey, can I ask a quick question about that um, for yeah. you? Uh, this is Becca from Cockroach Labs. Um, I was just wondering, how do you use the stats as input to constant folding? Um, so, that's a good question. So I, I would say it depends on the, so we, depends on the type of constant folding. And uh, you know, there are things like predicate-based constant folding, right, where you know, uh, if, if we see nothing in a predicate uh, matches a particular constant predicate, and so nothing, nothing in, in, uh, in a table matches that, then, then we can uh, constant fold the, the predicate to false. Uh, there are also things like, you know, uh, certain certain partitions have uh, the same min and max values. In, in which case, we would be able to constant fold that particular uh, that particular column into a constant, which would potentially trigger other other rounds of optimizations. Uh, so it's really you know making use of the the, the min and max properties uh, as well as the nonness properties. Right? Sometimes if you have a, uh, a not null predicate or null predicate, or sometimes the outer join generates certain implied predicates on nulls. Uh, then we would actually be able to uh, take you, make use of that uh, to do certain certain uh, optimizations based on the the null properties of the of the partitions, as so on and so forth. Awesome. So so it sounds like you're relying on the fact that these are really up to date stats and and not stale. Yes, they're they're always exact stats, and they're, so they're that means you're computing them on ingestion. You have to. Yeah. So they're I, I would say they're more metadata than stats. They're like they're actual metadata. Um, yeah. Yeah, but then there's always a trade-off because because it kind of also limits the the type of stats that we can collect because uh, you know we, we can't collect anything that's super super expensive uh, as part of this right so so uh, for example we we are missing certain type of uh, very expensive stats that are usually uh, can only be maintained in the background um, things like that um, yeah so so this is a very I would say this is a very simple model it actually. Uh, goes a surprisingly long way uh, that you know I when I, when I initially look at look at the, the, the stats that we have I also thought that we had lots lots of stats that were missing right uh, these are kind of traditional uh, optimizer stats in the, in the literature uh, many of these things we don't have but uh, actually they, they go a very very long way already uh, and, and you know we're, uh, we're by, and large, by and large we're able to generate good reasonable plans uh, with these, these stats that we have yeah. Hi, uh, Ryan again. Do you do you maintain these at the micro partition level and the table level uh, at all times, or do you have to scan all the micro partition metadata before you can plan for the table? Uh, we maintain them at the micro partition level and the table level, and 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 uh, and intermediate levels as well. So it's almost like a um, uh, it's it's like a multi level um, uh, metadata. So 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 they're they're more than two levels. I mean, they're more than the table level and the micro partition level. They're, they're intermediate levels as well. Depending on the, uh, that, that's really an optimization for the for the caching layer, uh, because because as I mentioned earlier, there there are certain tables with millions or multiple millions of micro partitions, and and you know caching all the data in, in memory is, is pretty expensive. 
so we've done a lot of optimizations in, in that aspect. And, and when we when you have you know, that many micro partitions, uh, the the micro partition management or the metadata management problem becomes also kind of a big data problem as opposed to a kind of a small data problem. So that's what we find uh, what we found very interesting because we have you know tables that are in a petabytes of range and, and you know millions of micro partitions. So we need to think we really really needed to think about these these problems. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, so I go into this this kind of picture, which is a pretty very simplified picture. So we have the uh, the query text input that goes into the parser, which produces uh, what we call create block internal representation. And after that, the the query plan, uh, sorry, the create block representation goes through semantic analysis, which is, which does you know name resolution, type checking, and all that. And then it goes into a, a round of logical rewrites. After that, we go to uh, micro partition pruning, and that's that's kind of technically part of the logical rewrite, but, but we take it out here because it's uh, especially important for for query, plan, uh, for query performance. And as you can see, we do this through the pruner component, and that's also shared with uh, in later in the plan rewrite phase. So after this micro partition pruning, we go through the initial plan uh, generation, which produces the query plan IR, which is what we dubbed the the query plan representation. And with this representation, we start uh, going to the, the plan, uh, I would say, rule-based uh, rewrites phase. And uh, there are a large number of rewrite rules that we apply here before we go into the cost-based optimization phase. Today, this is mostly focused on uh, focused on joint ordering. There are other smaller things like, like bloom filter optimizations that we do, but by and large, this is mostly joint ordering. And after that, we uh, kind of generate the physical plan. And once the physical plan is generated, we output the physical plan to be uh, to be executed uh, at at runtime. Um, so, you know, I, I want to briefly touch upon the, the terminology. So, the plan that we generate, the physical plan that we generate in the end, is a DAG. Uh, so, so Snowflake is a push-based uh, execution model. So, so there's uh, so the plan is a DAG that consists of operators which are connected by links. And operators is pretty you know traditional sense of, of a database uh, query engine operator which you know, process a set of a set of rows and and then you know it includes things like stand filters, join filters, joins, and aggregates, and, and so on. So this is um, this is pretty um, pretty simple. The links are also um, very clear. I think in terms of the, the what they represent, they essentially encapsulate the the data exchange operators. And uh, you know they we also they also include they also encapsulate adaptive mechanisms at runtime. For example, you know they can handle parallel distribution of data at runtime if, if necessary. Uh, the links also does not necessarily have to do the exchange, right? They, you know, they can be local links, uh, local synchronous links, uh, you know, asynchronous links, and so on. So there are many, many different types of links that uh, that can be generated depending on the depending on the uh, the plan. Also, you know, the links itself can be adaptive at runtime based on uh, what we see with the the order of magnitude of the data, with the skewness of the data, and, and so on. So this is kind of the overall terminology of the of the query plan, and this is a kind of a, a simple example of the query profile that our, our customer sees in in a Snowflake query. So I'm guessing this is a TFCDS query with uh, you know with uh, table scans are the leaf nodes, and there are filters on top of the table scan. As you can see, there are uh, two filters six and nine, which are filters on Top of the table five and seven, and there's also the join filter eight, which is pushed from uh, the other side of the table scan, uh, and we'll talk more about that later. And finally, there are join operators that are connecting them together, and there's aggregation and window functions on top. And finally, there's a write result operator, and uh, result result you know result generation is sometimes a surprising uh, kind of surprisingly bottleneck in inquiry uh, inquiry. Processing sometimes, you know, especially if a query produces a lot of rows, uh, and uh, usually the results are not uh, compressed as, uh, as well as uh, as well as the kind of the underlying data. Right? So, so there's actually a lot of overhead translating, uh, translate, you know, transport, sorry, transporting the result to the client. Uh, so that's actually an interesting problem in itself. Uh, and on the right side, there's the statistics um, that also talk about like kind of the uh, the the stats that's going on in this in this query. And uh, yeah, and then this is actually showing some of the debugging tools with the with the query plan, which I won't go into. 
Okay, hello. Um, I have a question. So this is Don from Penn State University. So um, I have a question that like all of these nodes are computational nodes, so intrinsically I know Snowflake is based on cloud, so all of them are separate executors in this case. Do you uh, think about like uh, anything like Fusion, all this kind of stuff? Second, um, uh, do you have anything that's pretty much like uh, kind of sense the locality of data, trying to make sure that compute and data pretty much happen somewhere close, so that you don't really kind of cause too many kind of remote IOs like from, right. yeah. Right, so the so, uh, so first question is, is about fusion of operators. Is that the? Yeah, so like you see this is like a full plan, but there's a lot of things that can actually kind of like fuse a lot of them together using some kind of co-generation techniques that commonly used right now in the right. last yeah. databases. Right, right, right. So, so um, we don't use co-generation itself a lot in our create execution engine. Uh, we use it only in the places that we, we think matter the most. Because our, our query engine is really uh, you know, a vectorized query engine, and, and in the majority of the cases, uh, this works pretty well. Uh, the places that are obvious that I think it doesn't work well, very well is in, uh, you know, when you have a super expensive expression. Uh, so that's, that's an obvious case uh, that, that, uh, that, we, that we use it. Uh, and the other, there are also other cases like uh, uh, transforming or, or yeah, transporting kind of serialized formats uh, of uh, what we call row sets over the network in exchange operator. Uh, so in this case, packing and unpacking the rows uh, becomes pretty expensive and a pretty, pretty expensive operation that can be, that's not very easily, uh, you know, uh, vectorizable, I would say. Uh, the, the, you know, in most other cases, our, our, our existing vectorized engine works pretty well and, and we don't really actually see a big need for, uh, for code generation. Uh, there are other kinds of fusion, I guess, you know, that, you know, that's pretty common to this kind of engine is, is, a, is a concept of a pipeline, right? So, so within, uh, it's not it's not listed here, but uh, you know, imagine the the links between these operators, uh, and uh, as, as you know, on this on this right side, uh, this right deep side, uh, everything can be viewed as this one pipeline. Uh, so so you know, all the links here are actually uh, would be local synchronous links, and uh, you know, the build side obviously they would they would need to be built separately and so on. Um, so so that's that's that that aspect. The uh, the second question I would say uh, bringing compute closer to the data. Is is what we do? What we do there is actually we try to uh, we try to affinitize the data access you know, within the compute cluster. And so we have local SSDs for each of the each of the execution nodes in a virtual virtual warehouse. And uh, usually, you know, there are, usually there are multiple queries running on the warehouse that are accessing the same table. So uh, we do something. Uh, relatively stand, standard, which is a consistent hashing across kind of nodes in, in the table, and the uh, and, and the table kind of the table scan um, essentially affinitized to these these kind of uh, consistent hashing schemes, and, and we're able to achieve uh, pretty good pretty good uh, cache hits overall uh, in in a in a virtual warehouse in most cases. Yeah, one follow-up, which, which is very interesting, because like I, I, I kind of know that it, Snowflake works in this particular model that like you can allow like users have their own storage, for example, to have their own S3 and have their older data hosting there. So like uh, by doing that, like pretty much you say like you can have like a gigantic cache caching in your own kind of like infrastructure, and trying to say like uh, I'm trying to pull as much query as possible inside your like inside your own Snowflake cluster. So like uh, there's still kind of a link. I mean, in a sense that there isn't another storage service you're talking to. So like there's number one, there's a cache coherence problem. If someone if he, they are actually using something else as well, like uh, while you're while you're they're using Snowflake, and also like I guess like uh, so like how do you actually trying to kind of minimize this type of I/O like going into another storage service as much as possible because that can be very expensive. So I guess what you're referring to is is uh, what we call external tables, where we allow customers to put data in a kind of a data lake like kind of storage bucket. Is that the functionality you're referring to? Yeah, I think so. Like I don't like like one thing I don't really quite understand is like so you always let users to do that, or like uh, you're most likely you're always always also hosting like most like most of the time you're hosting the data, all of the data from. Users. Yeah, so the, by by default, Snowflake actually hosts uh, hosts the data. Uh, so so the the functionality the functionality you're referring to is uh, really applies to the case where people would like to use Snowflake on a kind of a data lake setting, uh, and and they for for very various reasons they do not want to load the data natively into Snowflake. Uh, and these are the cases where we actually uh, you know actually build a functionality to 
to, uh, to scan directly over uh, kind of external stages in, in the blob storage. And, and there are the kind of the, the mechanism are, are, are very similar, although uh, the performance will not be as good as using the native Snowflake storage because uh, we have no control over, for example, the, the, the size of a particular file that the customer puts in there. And you know, they could be putting something super small, they could be some, putting something super large uh, that have you know, uh, inverse IO kind of uh, implications and so on. Um, but by and large, the, the caching mechanism are, are somewhat similar, but, but you know, it, it would not work as well as, as uh, over native uh, Snowflake storage formats. Yeah, but I, I would say Parquet is also pretty good, right? So Parquet has a lot of very good uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, very good ideas uh, to, to kind of uh, speed up, uh, speed up, especially for columnized kind of uh, query execution engines, Parquet is, is a pretty good file format. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, cool. OK, so now let's go a little bit of a, uh, a deeper dive into some, some of the optimizations. Um, some of them are pretty, I, I say, st you know, straightforward, but, but bear with me. Uh, so the first one we'll talk about is, is table scans and pruning. And uh, we all know that full table scans are very expensive for large tables, especially uh, for, for tables in Snowflake, we have you know, tables in the petabyte range. So uh, we we go out of our way to avoid scanning full table uh, avoid scanning full tables, and there are two mechanisms. One is we only scan columns that are accessed, and, and this is facilitated by the the you know the PAX format that we follow. Uh, and the other way is to to use pruning, which is to use column column metadata to avoid scanning uh, data that's filtered out. And exactly how much data can be pruned depends on the filters that apply uh, that appear in the query, as well as clustering of data in the table. And that's why we have automatic clustering service to kind of reorganize the table for uh, according to the dimension that the, the user, uh, the query actually uh, filters on. And uh, sometimes there's natural uh, clustering order uh, that we can make use of. So here's an exa example of a bad pruning. This is uh, the store sales table in TCDS, and we see there's a, a column list price. Uh, there's a predicate on this particular column. And the table scan, you can see from, from here uh, in the middle row, uh, the bottom here, we see the partitions total, there are 86 partitions. And we end up scanning 85,000, sorry, 86,000, we end up scanning 85,000 partitions. And that amounts to 1.26 terabyte of data. And that produces 28.4 gigs of rows. And as you can see, the filter is actually uh, quite filtering. And we see that it's actually about 100x reduction, uh, where it reduces from 28 gigs down to like 290 million rows. And there's, you know, there's the, the reason that this is not very filtering is because this list price is a column that it's not, uh, not, you know, the table is not classed on this column. So this is kind of a pretty, uh, pretty well distributed column uh, in uh, across all the partitions. So we can't really filter out uh, based on this particular predicate. And uh, a counter example here is if we add another particular predicate on the sold date, right? So then the table itself might be clustered by this date column, uh, it may not, be this exact date column, it could be some other date column where this is, has some correlation to, then, uh, then we would actually be able to prune out a lot of partitions uh, in the table scan. And as you can see that from the middle here, now we're scanning 10,000 out of the 86,000 rows, or sorry, 86,000 partitions, and we're only scanning 160 gigs here, and we're producing 3.4 gigs of rows, and after filter, so the filtering selectivity is, remains the same, right? This is still about 100x. But, but you know, now the inputs to the filter is much less. And now we actually see the result generation, like I mentioned earlier, is uh, actually taking up a relatively uh, large amount of time. And, uh, and this is an example of a good pruning. And so, OK, I guess this is a similar, the same query, but uh, this is kind of a click on the, with a click on the table scan. And we actually can see we are scanning uh, 23 columns, uh, or 24 columns, actually. Um, and this is kind of the table that is being scanned on. And so this is kind of a very simple example on, on pruning how, and how it works. And this, this is an optimization that will apply at compilation time. And so here's a bit of a deeper look at pruning. Uh, so on the left side is an example table with four columns. And the ones we care about are the ID columns and the date column. And as you can see, we have IDs from 1 to 5 and dates from uh, November 2nd to uh, November, November 5th. And we have four micro partitions for this table. And as you can see, the, the data roughly kind of uh, is in line with the, is roughly clustered by date, right? So we have a micro partition one, which is only 
only has the data from November the second, and uh, Michael Bergen two has uh, the second and the third, and, and so on. And uh, you can see the ID columns are, are relatively relatively random because you know on any given day we can have data arrived from any IDs in, in the in the table. So now let's say we have a kind of a simple query like this. We have a select name and country from T where ID equals to one and date is greater than equal to November the fourth. So we would actually be able to prune on this. And if you look at uh, the ID column, we can actually prune out the, the partition one and we can prune out partition three because we see that the min value of partition one is two. And then also for the min, min value of, uh, of ID column partition three is, is also two. So we know for sure that you know, these two columns would not match ID equals to one, so we can uh, prune out these two columns. And then we can also prune on this particular date column and we see that uh, for partition two, you know, the maximum of that uh, date is November the 3rd, which is less than November the 4th. So we're actually able to print out this partition as well. So uh, as, as, as a result, we, you know, we only need to scan one micro partition. So this is a kind of a very uh, simple case of pruning, but uh, as you can imagine, we, have, we can have a lot more complex uh, pruning, uh, you know, depending on the expression that's going on. So here are just some very, you know, a slightly more complex example. Uh, we have a lot, you know, in production, we have uh, you know, a lot more uh, complex expressions that we can actually prune on. Uh, so here is, let's say, I have a created down column, which is really a timestamp. And we actually want to truncate the timestamp to year and compare that with 2020. So this is a somewhat, you know, somewhat complicated function that we need to kind of understand the semantics of this function uh, to be able to evaluate pruning on this. So it's not as simple as you know, a simple uh, range comparison, uh, comparison of the min max and so on. Uh, and, and another example is like this. I have two columns, uh, salary and annual bonus, and I'm trying to evaluate the predicate, uh, which is the sum of these two columns is greater than, let's say, some constant. Right? In, that, in that case, we need to take into account kind of the min and max of the salary column as well as the min and max of the annual bonus column. So there are kind of like four input values. Uh, compare that to, um, to this uh, constant value. So, uh, you know, one, one thing I would emphasize is that the, the logic for pruning is actually different for, than compared to the logic for, for filtering because filtering is applying on an uh, individual rule and the pruning is applying for a range of data uh, so that we actually need to look at the, the min and max as well as the kind of the nullness property because certain expressions are uh, not eliminating and, and certain expressions, uh, you know, have, have certain predicates and certain, have certain behaviors uh, with regard to nulls. So, uh, and then the expression itself can get super complicated. Um, so, so this is a kind of a non-trivial, uh, non-trivial logic uh, for many cases. And oh, sorry, can I interrupt with a question? Yeah. Um, so uh, my name is Sandy. I work for Elemental. Uh, so this means you need to have basically like a full expression evaluator wherever you're doing your pruning. Is that right? Yes. Yes, I'm saying yes. Uh, so we have specialized kind of implementation for for pruning logic. Uh, Got it. Hi, uh, Ryan again. Do you, do you ever uh, cache the result of executing one of these expressions on a per micro partition basis so that you could at the local executor level decide to prune at some point? Um, so not at the compiler level, but at the, the local executor level, if that date trunk function you know is never true for a given micro partition, do you cache that? We don't catch it today. Uh, we've experimented experimented with it before, uh, and um, it's it's something that we would like to get deeper into. But but this is like some, something we have also um, thought about and discussed. Um, but but yeah, well, we had some prototypes, but we never actually uh, you know implemented this in production. Thanks, yeah. Jackie Supik here. Quick question. So based on the results of the pruning, uh, like based on the query profile, do you guys repartition the tables? And if you do that, how often is that? Like automatically repartitioning on some other column value. Like we saw that $180 thing, uh, is it possible Do you guys do that? Yeah, so repartitioning is, is, all, is done through uh, clustering, the clustering process. And today this is a, a user defined uh, process. The user needs to define the clustering key, which is a declaration of uh, intention to cluster the table by a certain way. And the clustering keys can be arbitrary, an arbitrary expression. So it can be something like date trunk up here and create it on, that can be used as a clustering key. And we would essentially reorganize a table by this particular predicate, um, but but the, you know, the user has to declare that, um, and and we expose all these information to the you know the you know the query kind of information above uh, like 
you know, sorry, like like this information we expose to the user, and the user can take a look at the, the pruning information here and decide whether this is kind of a, a useful predicate from for, for his uh, for the workload, and they they would actually uh, be able to specify these. Um, yeah, but we you know uh, we also realized that you know we could we, we could automatically do this, but but that's not something we're, uh, we're we have today. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And, and Hi, yeah, this uh, is Steven, and I have a question on the the complex expression on a day trunk. I've seen other engine we're trying to do a logical rewrite to move the uh, function on the column values into a range query. What is the philosophy on your optimizer in terms of how much time you spend on trying to unfold the uh, the input expression into something that can take advantage of your uh, metadata? Yeah, so we, we do that as well. So we do this uh, we do this unwrapping uh, optimization, which can, uh, which kind of converts the uh, uh, kind of essentially for for cast functions, which this is uh, for cast functions. We we can do this optimization where we uh, unwrap this into potentially uh, two range predicates, and uh, and you know uh, you know because we have kind of very highly optimized implementation for for range predicates uh, for simple range predicates, these can be evaluated very quickly, right? So. We have an internal set of uh, heuristics that decides whether it makes sense to prune on a particular partition uh, on a particular column, and uh, you know uh, when it when it makes sense, we would we would do these kind of optimizations to kind of improve the evaluation speed for for the pruning process. So we do that uh, as well. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. So let's. Yeah. So the the next point actually actually I was gonna I'm gonna talk about uh, I guess we you know. Um, People have already asked about, so I'll, I'll go to the, the next point, which is the, yeah, the query profile, actually, I talked about this as well. The query profile shows the number of micro partitions before and after the pruning, so people can look at it and actually make decisions. And uh, there, are, there are other optimizations that can enable pruning, which uh, I think these are, you know, should be pretty familiar to folks, and, and they're really kind of quite standard predicate optimizations, like filter push down, various form of filter move around predicate, uh, predicate move around optimizations and push, push down. Optimizations, transitive predicate generation from joins, uh, predicate factorizations, and implied predicate generation, things like that. Any anything that can essentially uh, open up new opportunities for for pruning uh, as part of the overall optimization pass. Uh, and that's why you know in, in the graph earlier we showed that there's this pruner component which can be applied multiple times uh, during the course of the query optimization. So if, when, whenever a new predicate presents itself. A, a new, a new, a new query optimization uh, opportunity presents itself. We would, we would iterate uh, until we kind of reach the, the kind of the, um, the, uh, the optimized kind of uh, uh, scan set information after applying these predicates. Uh, so now let's go to joins. For joins, uh, I guess this particular optimization we're talking about is join filter. So again, this is a DPCDS query where we're joining between the source sales table and the date dim table. On the date column, and there's a predicate on, on date column, and uh, you know this is this is hash join, and uh, the the notion in Snowflake is you know we, we put the build uh, this is a little bit reversed from other from some other systems where where we have the build side on the left side and, and we have the probe side on, on the right, and obviously here we get, we see that the store sales table is on the right side because it's a much larger table, uh, and uh, and what we see here is the join filter optimization uh, that we see on, on filter five, and the join filter essentially is an optimization that decouples the joins into two steps. Uh, so the join, conceptually, there's the join step, and the concept, there's also the filtering step. And essentially, what the join filter does is, is it takes the filtering step of the join and it pushes down that particular part into uh, into the table scan, into essentially into, into the probe side as much as possible, because there could be other joins here, and then the, the join filter will keep getting pushed down depending on the uh, whether it's legal to do so, and the, and there might be other limitations and so on. So, yeah. So here's the join filter, and essentially the the main idea for the join filter is to allow, allow the filtering part of the join to happen earlier. Uh, that's kind of decoupled from the actual join part of the join, uh, and to avoid you know subsequent processing like hash table probes and other kind of uh, expensive operations that happens as part of the join, as part of the you know uh, the join operation itself. So we have two techniques for filtering rows. One is bloom filtering. This is a pretty common standard technique, where uh, it's brought, bloom filter is you know basically probabilistic data structure that filters up most rows that can be filtered by the join. There will be a small portion of the rows that may still flow to the join to get filtered out eventually. 
uh, and our, our bloom filters are are you know not super large in size, uh, and and uh, you know but we are still able to achieve a, a very good filtering ratio in most of the cases. Uh, but it fundamentally depends on the on the data, the property of the data, and sometimes there's uh, it's, it's not super possible to it's not really possible to filter out anything uh, that could still happen. The other optimization is range pruning. Uh, this is what we call kind of a bloom uh, range vector optimization. Uh, the idea is that we maintain a summary of the ranges of value that will match the drawing. And this particular range pruning optimization, uh, or, or this data structure, we actually pu pushed into the, the table scan of the probe side, and we can use it to prune out micropartitions from the table scan before we actually form the drawing. Uh, so these are kind of the two uh, optimizations that we do uh, as part of drawing filtering. And this is kind of an example that shows this. And in the middle here, we can see pruning that's actually happening. And this is actually what's happening in the, in the table scan four here. And uh, the, you know, from the original 86,000 partition, we are only scanning 70,000 partitions here. And uh, this is due to the kind of the range bloom vector that we're, we're pushing down to the table scan to filter out the, the data. And for the drawing filter, uh, this is the bloom filter essentially. And uh, that will actually, this is quite selective in this case whereas we have uh, 23 gigs of input rows and we're outputting about five gigs of uh, output rows. So, um, so by and large, this, uh, the joint filtering optimizations is a very important optimization that we apply. Yes, okay. So next I'll talk about metadata optimizations. Uh, and this is also not very surprising because you know, our metadata are exact, our optimizer stats are kind of uh, exact stats. So we can use this to directly return results for queries. Um, the simple query on the right has a bunch of aggregations, and we can directly evaluate the aggregations using the metadata. And as you can see, the query plan is very simple. It's simply a, a row generator and with a result return. So that's kind of uh, what the plan looks like in that case. And um, yeah, like I mentioned, you know, Snowflake always maintains accurate stats. That's kind of what enables us to do it. And we can rely on stats to uh, optimize um, various facets of the query, a predicate, uh, aggregations, and, and subqueries as well. And yeah, finally, result caching, this is kind of what we uh, kind of discussed earlier before. And this is, in that case, the, the query plan will just look like this. There's a kind of a query result we use operator that just returns the result. Yeah. Okay, so now I, I want to talk uh, maybe uh, about two more optimizations, which are kind of, uh, in my mind, somewhat reflects the, the philosophy uh, of our optimizer implementation. One of them is uh, aggregation placement. So aggregation placement is also called a goodbye placement. Uh, it's also called goodbye pushdown in some cases. But but really, you know the, you know semantically speaking, you know goodbyes can be either pushed below a join or it can be pulled up uh, above the above the join itself in in the query in the algebraic kind of query plan tree, and uh, and you know the right place or the optimal place to evaluate the aggregation really depends on the 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 property of the join as, as well as the property of the group by, right? So if uh, a join is explosive, then it might make sense to uh, evaluate the group by before applying the join uh, if the group by is uh, re reductive, for example. And what we do, uh, the ultimate, the way we, we do it is uh, there are two goals. Right? One, one goal is to make it broadly uh, applicable. So the way we do this optimization is we, uh, if the aggregation can be pushed below multiple joins, then we would essentially, we would put we would place these uh, adaptive aggregation operators at all the all the places along the join uh, where it's legal to do so, and these will only effectively they will only be activated if we think it's uh, it makes sense to do so at runtime. So this decision making is is purely at runtime, and at compile time we would simply put these adap adaptive aggregations uh, at all the places where it's legal to do so, and. There are other optimization opportunities that can be opened up by this. For example, when an aggregation is put to the table scan, this allows us to uh, evaluate enco with encoded data, such as dictionary encoding, to speed up the execution. Uh, it also opens us opens up other opportunity like uh, like materialized views, rewrites, and others. Uh, but I, what I think is is even more important is is this uh, adaptive philosophy, where you know push down aggregations, uh, we we want it to be fully adaptive during query execution. And uh, the aggregation checks a, a pipeline global cost model to avoid performance regressions. And the moment the aggregation detected is potentially going to cause a performance regression, it will turn, turn itself off. And uh, so it independently switched to pass through 
And this is also, uh, it's, it's pipeline global, but, it, but it's also a kind of thread local model. Whereas there, we want to avoid the overhead of making this decision, the communication overhead uh, you know, across multiple threads. So, so this is kind of a thread local decision. And, and the good part about this is because, you know, uh, maybe, you know, there's some skews and some threads is actually, uh, would actually benefit from evaluating a grid and some other threads would actually not benefit. So, so this is also a, kind of a, a very good, um, very good reason to make this decision kind of thread local, but, but pipeline global uh, decision. Uh, and this is a kind of a simplified, uh, very simple model here. Uh, let's say on the, on the left side, we have the original query, which has the join uh, and the aggregation on top. And we have a uh, hundred thousand rows that's produced by the join in, in the default case. Uh, and we have the probe side that's producing 10K rows here. And uh, let's say this aggregation is actually not there uh, originally. And, uh, and this is kind of the cost of evaluating the the predicate. Let's say, let's assume the cost is simply a sum, you know, a sum of all the rows produced here. So that would be uh, 110 k here. And we compare that with the, the 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 case where the aggregation is actually activated, and uh, we observe that the aggregation is uh, achieving a reduction ratio of of 10 percent right, or, or 90 percent, depending on how you convert it. So so now we're producing only one k rows out of the aggregation, and even though the join is explosive, it's only producing 10 k rows here. And the overall cost of evaluation of here is just 10K plus 1K plus 10K, which is 21K. So in this case, it obviously makes sense to, to leave this enabled, to leave this aggregation operator enabled, uh, because it actually um, reduces the overall cost of, of the plan evaluation. And compare that to the second case, which is exactly the same plan, but uh, the characteristic of the join and the aggregations are slightly different. So let's see, let's say the join itself is, let's say a primary key, foreign key join, and there's no explosion, right? It's, it's kind of 10, it takes in 10 k rows, it produces 10 k rows. And uh, the, also the aggregation itself is not uh, super reductive. Right? It's only reducing 30% of rows. So in this case, uh, when we compare the original plan, uh, so the, you know, the cost is still 20K, but uh, the cost on the right side becomes 24K now, because now we have to evaluate uh, the aggregation on the 7K here. Uh, and, and that's uh, that's more expensive. Uh, so the, the overall cost model tells us that uh, you know the, it's actually better to leave this particular aggregation disabled. And and this is a runtime decision that we make. Uh, you know, it's, it's still a cost model, granted, but it's a cost model that we apply uh, that we apply at, at query runtime, not uh, query op optimization. So what does that what does that look like in the actual Im implementation in the code? Is it like a bunch of if then else statements, like if my plan looks like this, or, or is it like a, do you have like a general purpose pattern matching framework that can get triggered when you see query plans that look like this? Like how is it actually implemented? Yeah, so the, so it's actually, you know, the, the plan is the same actually. So, 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 you know, in, in both of these cases, the plan would look like exactly the same. It would be essentially be this plan. And okay. it's only this particular operator itself that will be able to turn itself off on and off essentially. Uh, so, so we kind of we try to generate relatively simple plans because uh, complex plans adds a lot of additional overheads for um, for the optimizer, especially if the plan. Uh, I would say especially if there's an explosion in the in the in the plan operators uh, early in the query optimization phase, it prevents us from iterating. Uh, it, it prevents us from applying uh, complex query optimizations because uh, there's a kind of fixed time budget or budget if you will that you know um, that we have to stop the optimization process and the more complex the plan is the more the more complex uh, these optimization or the more or the less passes optimize optimizations that can be applied so it's and always I, there and, you, and you're basically like just passing through tuples if, if you decide like I, I don't want I don't want to do this optimization yeah so in, in general any any op, any operator that's uh, that contains a buffering phase is a good place to do sampling so aggregation has certain kind of buffering operations and these are kind of built certain hash tables and, and we, can, we can essentially, uh, we, we see that we need to kind of buffer it anyway, so, so might as well do some sort of sampling to, to figure out uh, subsequent decisions essentially, yeah. And of course this here actually has to wait a little bit to observe the join, to have the, to have the join to actually also produce some data and kind of see that uh, and so on. Yeah, so this here is a little bit more complex uh, than that, uh, but that's kind of the, the idea. And this actually is a is kind of a good segue to this particular optimization. Uh, this is a small optimization, but I just want to talk about it because it's it's also somewhat different from what, what other database, databases do. Uh, so this is with optimizing of disjunctive joins. Uh, so this disjunctive joins actually, you know, the example is, is like here. 
So normal, I mean, the most common drawing is, is let's say it's the inner drawing with uh, a bunch of equality predicates. So left side dot A equals right dot A and, and so on. And there are also a certain type of drawings where the predicate is, is a disjunctive predicate like this. And you can imagine the, if the conjunctive predicate is not there, let's say if the, the first, first uh, cat conjunct is not there, then uh, the whole drawing is going to be disjunctive drawing. And uh, with the hash drawing implementation, by default, it's going to be a partition product. And uh, the way I think other databases um, kind of uh, implement this in the query optimizer is they would generate uh, union kind of, um, or some of them generate union all um, kind of shape of the, of the plan to actually um, evaluate the, each of these kind of disjunctive uh, branch potentially and depending on the um, different physical access paths, uh, it, it opens up other optimizations. And we actually want to avoid that because uh, one thing is because we want, as I mentioned above, like we want to, we want the query plan itself to be kind of simple uh, and and, uh, and relatively lightweight. And the other the other reason is uh, we we want to kind of try to reuse the existing optimizations uh, as much as possible. And what we realize that with existing joint filtering uh, optimization can be relatively easily extended to the dis disjunctive case, and uh, that's essentially what we go for. Uh, so, so essentially what we do is for drawings with disjunctive equality predicates, we would perform the drawings uh, using the hash tables which are built from the, uh, essentially the drawing keys in each of these disjunct uh, predicates. And uh, there's, a, there's a process later on that kind of consult, uh, reconciles the, uh, the results, but, but essentially we avoid Cartesian products here. And uh, similarly, we also generate uh, Bloom filters and joint bridge filters, and, and these gets pushed down to the probe side and uh, there's a little bit of additional logic to uh, to produce the disjunction of these of these results, but it, it's not it's actually uh, pretty pretty uh, easy to do, and uh, we also leverage a certain predicate transformation to kind of produce uh, these these type of predicates uh, to kind of to to enable us to generate these um, these uh, these particular uh, hash tables and and uh, and bloom filters and so on. Um, so this um, I want to kind of just briefly touch on this because because this also shows that. Uh, when, we, when we look at the optimization that can be applied uh, by transforming the query plan versus kind of uh, doing certain uh, optimizations at query execution time, we all, always kind of prefer the latter because we want to make the plan itself as robust and as simple as possible uh, to, to make sure the optimizer can make a good decision there. Um, the one, one thing I would really like to emphasize is uh, diagnosability. And for, for diagnosability, uh, we have re-execution of, of customer queries, uh, which, which includes select and uh, DD, DMO and DDL, uh, which include a query table select statements. And we also, we also have, uh, so this actually, sorry, th so this actually allows us to kind of debug uh, with the customer query itself. For example, we can, we can slightly tweak the, tweak the customer queries to, to, to run them. Obviously everything is, is obfuscated and we're actually not able to see any of the customer data, but we actually can see the performance of query and we can, we can try to kind of uh, tweak the, the query optimization based on that. And we also have a pretty powerful internal web UI based debugging and visualization tool. And uh, I like to emphasize that I think in, in, a, product, in a production quality, in a production uh, level database optimizer, the debuggability and diagnosability is, is almost the most important aspect, I would say, uh, of, of, the, of the tooling of, 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 this, of the implementation because, um, you know, um, Many times, it's very, very hard to roll out a particular uh, optimization because it's, it's uh, almost impossible to not cause a, a regression with a particular query optimization. So in that case, the ability to diagnose the issue, to look into the issue efficiently is, is uh, critical. So, so this tool that we have is available for all production customer queries. Essentially, what it does is it, it does a bunch of other things, but, but for the query, optimizer part, it generates the stepwise plans that captures the shape and expressions of the plan at each step of the optimization process. And uh, by, by capturing this, we can, uh, the developer can compare the plans and figure out at which step does things start to go bad and at, at which step we, we made the wrong decision. And it's, used, uh, it's also used for figuring out you know, whether an optimization should have happened or could have happened at, at a particular phase. Uh, so that's a super, super powerful tool. And uh, we also have runtime plan information like cardinality estimates, uh, round joint build site, explosive joints, and, and skews, et cetera. Uh, it's also integrated with optimizer hints. So uh, I found this pretty cool where the developer can actually play with the plan and, for example, drag and drop the plan to, to kind of 
get the, the join order that they would like to test out. And you know, we would generate optimizer hints that would actually uh, re-execute in the query to test out the hypothesis. And all these can be, can be applied uh, you know, on, on the on production uh, customer queries. Uh, of course, you know uh, this, is, this has zero impact on the customer. This is, uh, you know, this is completely internal uh, debugging uh, understanding, and uh, we, we have no um, we have no way to, to like look at any of the customer data. And uh, you know, again, another piece is uh, query reproducer. Uh, this is a common tool in many other production database systems as well, and uh, this allows us to reproduce customer issues locally. And this is actually a super very cool tool that we have here. Um, and yeah, like I would. I would emphasize, I think that the biggest challenge with, with almost any production uh, optimizer is the, the rollout of a new change to the optimizer because it's almost bound to cause uh, regressions and, and certain, uh, certain issues with existing customer queries. And, and that's often, uh, often something that's unavoidable and, and needs to be really um, carefully studied and mitigated. Uh, so I don't know if, Andy, if we have enough time. Uh, I have a um, bunch we're, of we're, we're a little bit over, how many, how many more slides do you have left? Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll just stop here because I have a, quite a few other slides, but I think this is probably the... Uh, okay, like, are, are, the, are the upcoming slides the, the, the keys to the, to the castle, like tell you, tell you all the magic you're doing, or...? <laughs> no, this is, like, I, I can quickly, like, in maybe one or two minutes go over, go over this. Like, I just uh, want to talk about our, our philosophy. I, I, mean, I mean, like, we're over time, I do have to tell my wife and the baby. I, 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 <laughs> I hate to cut it off, but, like, like, this is gold. Like, it's... I have a family now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I will thank Jackie uh, on behalf of everyone. So we have time for one question if anybody wants to unmute themselves, if they have a, a burning desire to ask him uh, something about optimization. Um, so I have one question. Hi, I'm Elena. Nice to see you again, Jackie. Yeah, <laughs> nice to see you. Elena is a student with my mind at CMU for other people. Keep going. Yeah, so I want to know, does the system ex explicitly call pruner to conduct pruning after every query transformation, like after applying a rewriting rule? Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't always do that, but uh, it will do that if the optimizer recognizes that there's a new predicate that becomes available. Uh, so the predicate is the key here. Yeah, so if we generated, a, if certain query optimization produces a new predicate that we haven't tried to prune on the table before, then we would try that. Yeah. Got it. All right, so uh, my question would be, uh, what does the join ordering algorithm look like? Is it just a standard DP, but like, you know, some system R? Yeah, it's a, is, is, yeah. It's a standard uh, cascades optimizer, so. Uh, oh, it's cascades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. How do you guys handle uh, how do you handle cost model estimations for? But it, it's sorry, is it cascades on the physical plane, or are you doing the logical plane transformations as well? Uh, it's kind of on the um, it's kind of on the logical join join tree, I would say. Okay. Um, but it based the you know yeah. How do you do how do you do cost model estimation for? Uh, like to do, to do early the branch of bound like for the for like logical plans when you don't have the uh, we don't have the physical plan yet. Do you do any optimizations there, or do you always have to go to the physical plan to get it to get a cost? Um, so, so I have to admit our, our current uh, algorithm is pretty pretty naive. So we're not okay. looking at any of the physical access paths and so on. So that's like our, our logical cost model is it's pretty straightforward. Just look at so hire Elena to do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll just look at the cardinality and, and things like that, uh, not, okay. not the actions and so on, yeah. Okay, awesome. All right, guys, thank you for coming. Again, I apologize for cutting it off, but like, uh, I, have, I have an underage child. Uh...